And great pleasure to have David Randall back with us again, uh, Dr. David Randall, um, consultant at the London, I believe, yes. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, four children, so a very busy man. But thank you for uh, making time, David, for us once again, uh, sharing from Psalm 27. It's a delight to have you, as always. Thank you. And let, let me read first, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll welcome you up to the the front here. So Psalm 27, a psalm of David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent, and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me, at his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I feel very much, you know, I, I'm, this is right in the kind of center of my world. I live down there, and that's where my church is. I work over there. <laughs> my wife works over there. She's a GP at uh, St. Stephen's practice in Bow. I don't know if anyone's uh, registered there. And then my sons go to school just over here at... Um, Harris, uh, Harris Science Academy. I've heard that there's someone here starting at that school. Uh, is that right? Okay, okay, well, maybe I'll make contact with him a bit later. Um, I've got a son starting there this year as well, so maybe they'll end up in the, in the, same, in the same class. Um, so uh, thanks very much uh, for, for, for reading, uh, Ollie. I'm going to be focusing on verse 4. We're going to look at the whole time, but I'm going to focus on verse 4. So I'll just read that for you. And then I'll pray, uh, and then we'll look at God's word together. Uh, so it says this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple. Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you that you're a God who speaks, and Lord, we know you speak through your word. And we pray now that you would speak, and that we would listen. Uh, Father, I pray for your help at myself, that what I say would be helpful um, and that uh, your word would, would speak to us with force. And I pray for each of us that we'd have the concentration to listen uh, and soft hearts that are ready for your word to come in uh, and make its mark on our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, a couple of weeks ago I was putting my boys to bed uh, and I don't know if it was just a delaying tactic, but I don't think it was. I think it was a sincere question. Uh, one of my sons looked really sad and really troubled. And he said, Dad, can I ask you a question? I said, of course. He says, Dad, will heaven be really boring? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, 
Fair, fair question, really. Uh, so we talked a bit about what we have to look forward to as Christians, and we talked, you know, the Bible talks about new heaven and a new earth. It said everything that we enjoy in this life, all the really good things in this life, will be there, and they'll be perfect, and they won't be spoiled by sin. Uh, but I also said, you know, the, the best thing about heaven is that God will be there. Jesus will be there. And he said, oh. <laughs> and he wasn't quite convinced that I think, I think he's probably... Uh, vocalizing what many of us perhaps feel. What does it mean to spend eternity with God? Is that a good thing? I mean, I, I know we feel that it ought to be, uh, but what does that mean? Um, well, here, David says, One thing I ask from the Lord is only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Is that what you're seeking? Is that what I'm seeking? Does that sound good? Um, well, hopefully, as we look at, at, at his words, that might... Uh, that might start to excite us uh, and hope we, hopefully we can get a vision of, of how good that is. Uh, we need to get our heads around what this means. It's difficult for us to understand because this idea of looking at God seems to go against some of the other things we're told in the Bible. Here's three reasons why it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about looking at God. First of all, God's invisible. We're told that in, in very straight terms in the Bible. Uh, when when uh, Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, he says, he describes God as immortal, invisible, the only God. So one of the qualities God has is that you can't see him. So what does it mean to gaze on God if you can't see him? He doesn't have a face, he doesn't have a form, he's not made of, of stuff like, like you or I am. What does it mean to look at someone who's invisible? Um, this is a, a big part of the experience of the Old Testament people of God. When they come out of Egypt, Egypt was stuffed full of gods you could look at. Obviously, they're not real gods, but these statues of, of, of great things, you can see them in the British Museum, these great gods statues you know, with funny, funny heads and that kind of thing. Very impressive to look at. And they come out into the desert, and who are they worshipping? Well, it's a God who can't be seen. Appeared to Moses in a burning bush, but God's not a burning bush. Appeared in a great pillar of fire and cloud, but God's not a cloud. There are these ways of thinking about God. He's described in different words to us. He's described as a father or a husband or a shepherd. But what does that mean? What does he look like? How can you gaze on a God you can't see? Jesus says uh, to the Samaritan woman, God is spirit. He's made of stuff, but it's not the same stuff we're made out of. So how can you see a God who's invisible? Secondly, he's dazzlingly bright. God is so completely holy and perfect that to look at him is to be destroyed. Actually, if you're you and me, we can't look at God and live. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a kid, I went on camp and during this camp there was due to be a solar eclipse, uh, which we were all very excited about as, as kids. And yet the leaders ran around telling us, don't look at it. Don't look at it because your eyes will be burned. When I was at university, there was something called a, uh, a transit of Venus, where the planet Venus passes across the surface of the, of the sun. And again, got all the same stuff from the university this time. I mean, we thought we were adults, we could make our own decisions, but they, they were so worried about us burning our eyes from looking at this uh, planet going across that they set up this, uh, this, this thing in the, in the university grounds, a, something called a camera obscura, where, you, where it, it cast a sort of shadow and you could, you could watch the planet going across the face of the sun. But all you could see was a reflection, because to look at the sun itself is so bright so dazzling that it burns our eyes. Well, again, in, in 1 Timothy, at the end of 1 Timothy, Paul says, uh, God alone is immortal and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one ever has seen or can see. The eyes of sinful man, people like us, we can't look at God because he's so brilliant, so dazzling. Um, you might remember the story of Moses going up the mountain uh, to get the law on Mount Sinai. And he goes up. Uh, and Moses says to God, now show me your glory. And God says, I will cause my glory to pass in front of you. I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. But you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. 
And Moses is hidden in this part of the rock and God's glory passes past, but he can't see God's face because it's so dazzling. You might think of those, um, the vision Isaiah gets in his book where he goes into the temple and, and sees God on his throne and the, the angels there are covering their faces. Even the angels can't look at God because he's so bright, so dazzling. Third problem with seeing God is we're told not to picture him in the Old Testament, in, the, in, the, in those Ten Commandments. The second commandment is don't make any pictures of God. Don't think that he's, don't draw him like some old man up in heaven on a cloud. Don't think of him in those ways. He's too big, he's too glorious. We can't condense him down to an idol or a statue or a picture or an icon or whatever it might be because he's too good, he's too big. Solomon, uh, when he makes his temple, is really aware of this, this danger that he's made a little house for God. He was told to make a house, wasn't he, for God's presence to dwell. But he's so aware that we don't create a little box for God to live in, a little frame that holds him. Solomon says, will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I've built? God does come down in some way. His glory comes into the temple as a great cloud and fire and, and everyone's amazed. So in some sense, God is dwelling there in his temple. But there's in no sense does God fit into a box or onto a picture frame. So with all of this in mind, what does it mean to seek his face? That's what David says. He talks about gazing on, gazing on him in verse, uh, in verse 4. Uh, he said, talks about seeking God's face in verse 8. What does that mean? What does it mean to seek the face of someone who's invisible, who's incredibly dangerous, and who tells us not to make pictures of him? Is this some kind of weird, mystical experience? You know, the kind of thing that people, that kind of odd, odd monks and so on do. They go off and live in a cave for 20 years to try to get some mystic experience of God. Is God just some kind of devastating cosmic explosion? I don't know if you've seen the, um, the Oppenheimer uh, film, but they, the, you know, the, this guy is making the first ever nuclear bomb and the, the, the key moment in the film, they set this thing up in, um, I think it's in New Mexico in the desert and they put this bomb on a big pole and then they all go back miles, several miles they have to go back uh, and they all put on dark glasses and blow it up and there's just this kind of dazzling explosion, huge release of energy and they're just standing back with their, with their dark glasses. Is that what it means to look at God's glory? Well, hold that thought. What does it mean to see God's face? Just hold that thought and that question. And now we're going to dive into uh, the, the rest of the psalm, if you like. So Psalm 27, uh, we're told in the inscription it's written by uh, David. That's King David in the Old Testament. Um, we don't know when he wrote it, but it's a time clearly of intense personal opposition. Some people think that this was at the beginning of his life when he's an outlaw. He's been anointed as king, but there's another king on the throne and he's uh, run, running he kind of got a band of people around him. Some people think it comes later in his reign when his, uh, his son Absalom has deposed him as king and David's had to, had to run away uh, with a few loyal followers. It's not clear and it doesn't really matter. It's clearly uh, the context is of intense personal opposition and possibly betrayal as well. In verse 10 he says, My father and my mother forsake me. We don't know whether that means that there was a time when his mum and dad actually turned, went, turned against him, or possibly they died. Possibly they died by this time. So he's thinking, even my mum and dad, I haven't got support for. I'm, I'm totally on my own. And he is being viciously and personally attacked uh, by people who are opposed to him. Uh, in verse 2, it talks about people trying to devour him. Actually trying to kind of eat his flesh, if you like. That's how, that's how much people, people hate him. Uh, if you look at, at 12, the context particularly seems to be malicious accusations, false witnesses, people twisting the truth, people lying and saying that, uh, things that aren't fair about him. Uh, that seems to be uh, the particular context of this psalm. So what I want to draw your attention to is this is a real world psalm. This is not the psalm of someone who's gone away from the world 
and, and, and living in some monastery or trying to just kind of read books and, and sit there and think about God. This is a real world psalm. This derives from intense and painful personal experience. I wonder where you're at in your life right now as you come into church today. Maybe things are kind of generally okay. and You've got much to be thankful for. Perhaps you're facing particular personal uh, opposition. Perhaps there's people who've really got it in for you. Uh, that might be at school, coming to the end of the holidays and you're thinking about going back and there's some real difficulty in your class. Perhaps it's at your place of work and there's someone who's making your life difficult. Maybe there's a whole system that makes things very, very hard for you. Uh, maybe there's someone in your family who has, uh, has really got it in for you. Perhaps it's because you've done the right thing. Perhaps you're being opposed because you've spoken the truth or, or been a witness to the Lord. Or possibly there's just a general sense of opposition. And what I want you to realise is if we're Christians, we do have a personal opponent to our life in Jesus, and that's the devil, who's described in the New Testament as like a lion prowling around trying to devour us, just like these people are trying to devour David. There's someone who's against you if you're a Christian. He's trying to demoralize and, and, and drag you down. Uh, and he comes along with false accusations, with malicious accusations. You're no good. You're a terrible mother. You've failed in this way. How can you call yourself a Christian? What kind of a husband are you? Do you think God will ever have you back after what you did there? You're fake. Well, that's the context here. It's a very long way away from kind of escaping and contemplating God's glory. It's a time of real personal and painful opposition. What does David do? Well, actually, as uh, Ollie was mentioning earlier, he expresses extraordinary confidence, especially in the first half of the psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He just states it. You know, this dark situation that I'm experiencing. Actually, the light, the light on the hill, the lighthouse is, is the Lord. My salvation is the Lord. There's a hymn which I think we might sing later that talks about being surrounded by salvation. Those are the walls. The Lord is his salvation. He states that. He talks about God being the stronghold of his life. Uh, and then he talks with this real confidence that even though these people are coming against him, they will stumble and fall. It's not me who's going to be brought down here. They will be. God will deliver me. Though an army besiege me, I won't fear. Even though war comes against me, I won't fear. I won't be discouraged. I'll be confident because of the Lord. Not because of anything in himself but because of the Lord. And the imagery here is all of, is all of castles and, and walls and fortresses. That's how he's picturing God. God is his defense. He doesn't have to make his own defense. He doesn't have to run around with his own plans. God will vindicate him. God will defend him. And he's got such confidence. And I just want to bring out that idea, that if you're a Christian, you can have real confidence in life. You know, we don't have to be terribly timid people worrying about things. Actually, Christians can do extraordinary things, extraordinary bold and brave things because our confidence is in the Lord. He's our fortress. He's our salvation. We don't need to fear failure or personal uh, kind of, you know, getting things wrong. As long as we're trusting in the Lord and seeking to do what he's told us to do, we can be really bold and brave things, do really bold and brave things if you look down at the history of the church, it's filled with Christians who do amazing things, really big and bold, confident things, because they're trusting in the Lord. We don't have to fear failure in the same way other people might, because God's on our side. With your help, I can advance against a troop, says David a few psalms earlier, Psalm 18. With my God, I can scale a wall. I don't have to be afraid. I can do amazing things, because God is on our side. So with this in mind, his confidence in who God is, this picture of God as his castle, he's able to turn his back on his opponents, not worried about them, and he turns in and it's almost like, um, I don't know if you can imagine one of those like fantasy films where they're running from this horde of orcs or, or whatever it is, some, some terrible opponent, and they, they run back inside their castle and, and slam the gates, and maybe the, you know, the arrows are clattering against the walls and all the shouting and so on going on outside. 
he gets inside his castle, and he's secure. But instead of focusing now on what's outside, it's almost like he turns away from that, and he looks inside at who he's looking at, and the beauty of the Lord. Do you see that change from verses 2 and 3? The wicked are coming, the enemies, the army's besieging, even then I'll be confident. And he turns away from that, and he says, one thing I ask from the Lord, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And it's almost like the picture of the temple becomes kind of like a castle. And the reason is not the physical fabric of the building, because actually this is a tent. This is a tabernacle tent. This is not going to provide any kind of physical protection to him. His protection is the Lord. And he comes into the temple, into this tent, if you like. He's not relying on the thickness of the fabric to protect him. He's relying on the Lord to protect him. So he turns away, he comes into his castle, which is the Lord. And then it's like, wow, he doesn't just see some empty courtyard with a few you know, bows and arrows leaning against a wall or something. He sees the Lord inside his, inside his temple. And what he finds when he turns away from the noise of the world, when he turns away from the army that's persecuting, when he turns towards the Lord, what he sees is just so beautiful. And I want to focus on that idea of the beauty of the Lord. Because beauty goes a little bit beyond simply listing what's good about God. Some people don't like learning theology. They think it's boring. They think it's dry and dull. Uh, And it can be if it's done the wrong way. If you just read a a book of theology and it's like, you know, chapter 3, subsection 7, paragraph 5, line 2, and it says this, God is eternal. It feels very dull, doesn't it? But when you see that, when you see who God is, when you see what that means, God becomes beautiful. And beauty is some response that we have to what God is. You know, theology lists out what God is, and it's so good and important to learn. But then when that has its effect on us, and we start to respond to it, that's when we can talk about the beauty of the Lord. It's what, it's what God's goodness does to us. There's many bridges in the world, aren't there? You get some very, very dull bridges, dull functional things made out of concrete or bits of steel or whatever, and they, they, they do fine, they get you across the river. But then you get some really beautiful bridges, really, really beautiful bridges, bridges that make you want to get out a pencil and draw them or get out your paints. You just want to sit there and look at this bridge because it's so beautifully built and it does something for us to look at that bridge. There are many hatchback cars that allow you to get, you know, get your family around, get your shopping in the back. But sometimes someone designs a hatchback car that's so beautiful, that looks cool, looks fantastic. And the manufacturers can charge three or four thousand pounds extra because everyone wants this car because it looks so fantastic. There are many modern music songs that are recorded and they have a little bit of time in the charts and then they're forgotten and they pop up every now and, now and then on the radio. And yet there are some songs that are so memorable that just fit with us and people love them. Perhaps they express some deep emotion or they, they're just so catchy. Um, I, was, uh, I was watching a documentary a while ago about what music does. If you get a pe- group of people in a room or probably in a field or something like that, and you you play music to them, everyone's brainwaves start to move in tandem. They've done this. They put electrodes all over people's heads. And when people listen to music together, all of their brainwaves go at the same time. And that perhaps expresses that kind of, that way music can bring people together. You know, that great sense of kind of excitement you get when you're, when you're all listening to a piece of music together um, and that, that sense of, of community. Um, they were using in their study a song by Stevie Wonder, Superstition. Do people know that song? If I was to play it, I'm sure you'd, you know. They say that song is the most danceable song in the world. Apparently, if you were to play it now, almost everybody would start, you know, shifting their, shifting their weight from one foot to another or tapping, tapping their hand or whatever. Um, these music, it's just a series of notes, isn't it? Singing and whatever. But when it plays, it excites something in us. 
It changes us. That's what beauty does. When you see a beautiful vision of mountains or bridge or car or whatever, or you hear this music, it does something to us. And that, I think, is what the psalmist is talking about when he talks about the beauty of the Lord. It's not just a list of objective things that are good about God. But actually the beauty is we see that and we think, wow, and it changes us. It moves us. It's as if we start tapping along to the beat or or shifting our feet or whatever because of what this thing does to us. We are made to adore God. And when we listen to good music, when we look at some fantastic view or some seascape or the night sky or whatever, something in us responds to that and we feel a lightness in our our heart. That leap, that connection that we feel is in some imperfect way us worshipping God. And many people are not Christians and they they just experience that reaction and they don't know why. But actually everything we see around that makes our hearts sing is a, is a little testimony to what we're, here, what we're here for as humans. We're creatures who are made to worship. We're made to enjoy beauty. Uh, and we, we echo that when we see beauty in the world around us. Novels, films, art, all the creative industries that produce stuff for human consumption. They're capturing this hunger we have at a deep level for God. This is why we sing. Look at verse 6. Then my head will be exalted. This is after he's gone into the temple, looked at the Lord. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. This is where he's just been chased by this band of people who want to eat him up. These people are saying terrible things about him. He's kind of run into the house of the Lord to escape them. He's looked at the Lord and now he just wants to sing. Wants to sing. Isn't that amazing? And we can have that experience too. If we bring our troubles, we bring our persecutions, our difficulties, the hardship of life and we come before the Lord and we see who he is. And we are moved to worship and to sing uh, just as David was. Not dry theological reflection, but a living, whole person experience of God. Uh, I went to, uh, to the football yesterday, took my sons. We went to Lake Orient um, and uh, it was great. We were 2-0 up, everything was good. Uh, and then it absolutely started tipping it down in the second half. I'm sure you all kind of experienced this. Um, you could barely see the players. It was raining so hard. Um, and there was just this dramatic thunder and lightning over the stadium. You know, this massive thunder and lightning, uh, streak of lightning all the way across the sky and deafening, deafening thunder. Um, but when we see that, when we see that magnitude, that, 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 that extraordinary outburst of power, and we're, we're awestruck, aren't we? If you ever had that experience of, of seeing a great thunderstorm. That is the kind of, think about how that makes us feel. It takes away our breath. We're dazzled, we're amazed. That's something of what we'll see when we see God. His great power. His great creative power. And it blows us away. Think about the, the amazement we see when we see the most delicate, beautiful flower and if you get your magnifying glass out and you study it and you see the shapes and the curves in the petals you see the veins you see the translucency and the colors that that blend and you think wow who did that when you put on your David Attenborough and you see these amazing the amazing complexity of life uh, and the beauty of all the animals that have been made and the plants and how the ecosystems work together and just a, just a sheer variety of butterflies there are or monkeys or whatever and just, just the amazing uh, complexity and beauty of what God's made and you think, wow, look at yourself, how we're made and something inside us is excited. Think about the beauty of scripture. You know, sometimes when you're reading your Bible and you think, wow, this is speaking directly to me. This person who wrote that, they know, I, I know exactly what they're meaning. 
And I had never thought about how God's goodness applies to this situation. I would never have thought of putting it in that way. Wow, these words, they were written in Hebrew or Greek and they've been translated into English and it, they speak into my heart and, and it excites you. You think, wow, that's the beauty of the Lord. The beauty of, you know, the, the awesome beauty of the thunderstorm, the amazing com- complex beauty of creation, the, the beauty of scripture, how it speaks into our hearts. Uh, and perhaps chiefly, I think, the beauty of mercy and grace, the beauty of the gospel. Um, last week, I was, um, we went with our family on this sort of um, Christian family camp, and we took along a load, of, a load of kids, some from our church and from other places. Um, and I was doing the talks, and um, I was doing a series of talks about the parables that Jesus tells, uh, parables from Luke. And I decided to do it based on a Mr. Man theme. So we had these different, you know, I, I produced these, these pictures of different Mr. Men and, and what they show us, the different characters um, in the parables. And then at the end of the week, they were all kind of being auctioned off. The children got to take, take home these different pictures. And the most popular one was Mr. Lost. Mr. Lost. We did it about the, the lost son, the prodigal son. This boy who wanders off, you know, is, is stupid, reckless, uh, really bad, but he ends up totally lost and far from home. And he had a picture of this kind of Mr. Man character walking one way, looking at his map, looking sad and miserable. And the father comes running down the road to him and, hurl, and he throws his arms around this son who's got into a terrible mess, been really bad, but there's a way back. There's a way back. And he's welcomed back into the family and given a ring and given new clothes and new sandals. And there's a huge feast and a celebration because this son of mine who was lost is now back. And the beauty of God's grace. Uh, and as I was, as I was uh, doing the talk, I got a bit emotional actually. I couldn't manage to keep, I was losing my voice a little bit because of just the beauty of people who are lost you know, the people you see outside Whitechapel Tube Station whose lives are just in a total mess. These people are welcome into God's kingdom. The prostitutes and the tax collectors are entering the kingdom ahead of you, Jesus says to the Pharisees, because God loves the lost. He has deep compassion for people who have made a total mess of their lives. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Can you see why David wants to be in the temple and look at this God who both made the awesome uh, complexity of the, of the solar system and, and the planets and everything, but who also loves people whose lives are messed up and ruined and who sent his own son to die on the cross to bring them back? Start to see the beauty and grace of the Lord. Well, as Ollie said uh, earlier, there's a, a note of kind of insecurity comes into the psalm, in the second half of the psalm, uh, from verse 7. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says, seek his face. Your face I will seek. Don't hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant away in anger. Don't reject me or forsake me. My mother and father have forsaken me. But, but, but he's calling out, don't treat me in the same way. There's, a, there's suddenly an insecurity here. And um, different commentators have tried to understand what's going on here. Uh, some of the more sort of liberal ones have said, oh, maybe this was two psalms that have been joined together. I don't see any reason to, to think that. There's a complexity in our experience as Christians. We can have this real confidence that God will deliver us. Uh, and then we can also have these feelings of, oh, do I really have to go back to that? And I think this is David's experience of having escaped from his foes, looked at the Lord, and then realizing that life goes on. At least for now it does, doesn't it? We're not yet there in new heavens and new earth when we'll see and experience God forever. Actually, we have to go back outside. Those people are still out there. Uh, and it, and there's, a, there's a sadness about that sometimes, an anxiety, a restlessness, all these, all these experiences we feel and they're reflected in Scripture. I don't want this to end, David is saying. I'd much rather stay in the temple and look at the beauty of the Lord forever. We live in a world which is made ugly, and threatening and violent by sin. And actually, we have to go back out there. Sometimes you feel this even after Sunday and you're thinking about going back to work on Monday. And you're thinking, oh, I wish I could stay with my brothers and sisters at church. I've been so encouraged. 
I've been so blessed. Perhaps you've had the experience of, uh, you know, serving on this on this holiday club uh, next week, and I, I pray that that goes really well. Uh, and you know, you have this great kind of sense of doing doing things together and serving the Lord, and you feel so encouraged. And then you've got to go back into the workplace where things are so stressful, so broken, so difficult. People are not godly. People don't love you. They're harsh. They're critical. Well, David has to go back out there and face these people who've chased him into the temple. But he goes back, actually, with a quiet confidence. And that resurfaces the last two, two verses of the psalm. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the land, Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You see, we have this confidence as Christians. We see now in part... Uh, Paul talks about this. We see now as dimly through a mirror, we see the reflection of the goodness of the Lord. We experience it in part when we come and we join together or we read our Bibles and we see something of the Lord's goodness. One day we'll see perfectly. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Oh dear, I've dropped my bit of paper. Let me get Otherwise I've run out of things to say. We're nearly at the end. So how do we square the circle? We talked at the beginning about David wanting to seek the face of the Lord. And we said, how does that work? Because God's invisible, God's dangerous, and God says, don't draw pictures of my face. So what does it mean to see the face of the Lord? Well, the answer is in Christ. This is what David had a hint of, but never experienced. In Christ, we see the face of God. Colossians chapter 1, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God's invisible, but Jesus is not. Jesus was made of atoms and cells, just the same as you and I are. John says, no one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who's at the Father's side has made him known. Those disciples 2,000 years ago and the soldiers and the Pharisees and the children and uh, the women who followed him, those people who saw Jesus saw God, saw the face of God. And one day, all of us will see the face of God if we're trusting in Jesus. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. This is John 14. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after all I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. As we read about the life of Jesus, as we imagine in our minds his interaction with these different people, we read of his compassion, his love, his stories, his answers to questions, his way of life, the way he treated individuals. We are seeing God, God made flesh. See, for the Christian, the hope of seeing God's face is not some, you know, some weird thing that philosophers and mystics do in caves or monasteries or something like that. Seeing the face of God is something that all of us will do in our flesh. In my flesh, I will see God, says Job. It's a physical, face-to-face encounter with the risen Christ. In John, 1 John 3, it says this, Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You and I are going to see Jesus as real as you see me now. Because he's risen, and he never gave up his body. He's there in heaven with a body. And he's coming back and we will see him and we will meet him. We will see the face of God in the person of Christ. Scary business when John sees him in Revelation. He falls down as though he's dead because Jesus is so dazzling, so beautiful, but so dazzling. And then he's reassured and he's helped to his feet. And we will see face to face the Lord God. What do we do now? Well, two things. One is to seek the Lord in his temple. 
If you're at the moment feeling a bit overwhelmed by the attacks of the evil one, by the attacks of people who are against you, run away to your castle. Run away to the Lord and seek his face. When you seek his face, those things will, will, will just, just go away. Those cries will be muted. The attacks will be, will be dampened because God is your fortress. He's your light and your salvation. So run away. Seek the Lord. And then, verse 14, wait for the Lord. We can seek him now because he's made himself known. We can seek him in the person of Christ. We can seek him in his word. We can seek him among his people. But there's also the not now, which is where we wait. We wait for the Lord to come back. Then we'll see him fully. Now we can seek him in his word. The story is uh, told of a Welsh preacher, an old, I'm not going to try to do the accent. It will go horribly wrong. Uh, I might get through the first half sentence and then it will fall apart. An elderly Welsh preacher. And he was preaching in his, um, in his church and he told a story about him growing up and when he was a boy like many boys in Wales he loved rugby and he absolutely idolized this particular uh, rugby player and uh, you know fantastic player and he, he really wanted to be like this guy and one time when he was a boy he got to meet this Welsh rugby international and actually went on a trip with him he got to go and go fishing with him and he, spe- he said I spent that time fishing And it was a total disappointment to him. He said, the nearer I got to that guy, the smaller he became. As he saw all of his disappointments, his failures, he wasn't a very nice guy, he wasn't pleasant, he didn't treat him well. The nearer I got, the smaller he became. Then he said, I met the Lord Jesus. And I've been following him these last four decades. And with Jesus, the nearer you get, the bigger he becomes. The bigger he becomes. And he's what we need. He's what we need in life. Life with all its problems and difficulties. Fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Seek his face. And the other things will pass away. And one day we'll see the Lord. Thanks, Ollie.